in man-made stuff and also in nature, we see lots of amazing shell structures. If you are into engineering design, you are wondering what is special about shells besides that they can have cute creatures in them. In this video, I will try to answer this question and also give you an insight about the world of shell design. I will divide this episode into three sections. The theory and beauty of shell structures, mathematical derivations for a simple cylindrical shell, and finally software implementation to optimize shell design. In the past few months in Princeton, we've been exploring the theory of shells and plates in Professor Sigrid Ardrianson's class where we also had the opportunity to meet well-known engineering speakers in academia and also in practice, such as Chris William, John Axendorf, Philip Bloch, and many others. Let's start first with the basics. When we are applying a load on a structure, let's say it's made of concrete, we know for sure that concrete is strong in compression and weak in tension. Hence, we can intuitively find that if we want to build a structure that spans a distance L, then it is more efficient to use axial mode than to use flexure mode. This is because in axial loading, the whole cross section is involved in resisting the load. On the other hand, in flexure mode, some part of the cross sectional area experience low stress state or even undesirable stress state such as tension in case of concrete. So we have established that curving the structure in the direction of the load allows for better participation of the cross section in resisting the load. This is something that master builders intuitively knew centuries even before calculus was invented. For example, in my hometown in Tyre, the Phoenicians and the Romans built arches that span several meters using only manually cut stones. In the arch, the force due to the self-weight gets axially channeled to the support without introducing any or just having negligible moment. In fact, if we want to find a form that is completely acting in compression under the self-weight, first, we can span a cable over the desired distance. Since cables cannot carry compression, this form is completely in tension, and this is called funicular shape. Next, freeze this form in space and rotate it 180 degrees and now you have a form that has only compression in it. This discovery is attributed to Robert Hooke in 1675 who concluded that as hangs the flexible line, so but inverted will stand a rigid arch. By the way, we met with the Professor Stefano Gabriel who introduced us into a new tool called R funicularity that aims at quantifying the quality of the form found shapes. I will leave a link in the description to his paper. Another more famous example of curved structures from ancient builders is the Pantheon in Rome, which was built in year 126. The dome spans 43.4 meters, which is equivalent to three school buses with a rise of around 21.8 meters. The dome has ribs, but it's completely unreinforced. The only way for such a structure to span such distance is to use curvature to reduce the flexural mode. Shell structures are also observed in nature due to the same reason in resisting applied loads and also for other considerations. The snail, for example, needs to resist an applied hydrostatic pressure so it evolved over millions of years to produce such design that is made of one curved shell. Sea urchins and turtles, on the other hand, do not have monolithic shell, but actually have subdivisions and sutures between them to achieve more flexibility while resisting the loads. The field of studying nature and applying it to engineering design is called bio-inspired design. We also met with Professor Francisco Marmo, who talked about the behavior of sea urchins thin shell in resisting the applied loads. As mentioned earlier, ancient builders did not know calculus or even have computers. 
yet they were able to build such amazing structures. During the end of the 19th century, engineers started to use reinforced concrete, which made it easier to construct straight elements, such as reinforced concrete slabs, instead of using vaults. Reinforced concrete and straight elements became more attractive to engineers due to the easier design empirical methods and also due to the formwork. Generally, structure engineers prefer to design straight elements because they seem easier than curved structures. Since that time, shell structures applications have declined substantially. Recently, due to the revival of a graphic static and its incorporation in computer software, and due to the rise of digital fabrication, shell structures are coming back. What I want to prove to you in this episode is that shell structures analysis is not hard if we understand the basics. So let's do some quick math. Let's say we have a cylindrical shell under self-weight or any arbitrary loading. Cylindrical implies that the shell is curved only in one direction and it is straight in the other. Let's take a very small element and have the external pressure applied in the middle. This force can be projected into three mutually orthogonal directions, Z towards the center of the curvature, theta along the meridional axis, and X along the straight direction. We can denote the corresponding axial forces as well as in-plane shear force per unit length as Nx and theta and Nx theta. Remember, as we move along the element, each internal force has corresponding incremental change depending on the direction. In this figure, we are assuming that the shell cannot carry bending, so we have no bending moment. For example, summing the forces in the z direction, we have Pz times the area of the element as the applied load. This is balanced by the meridional force from both sides projected on the z direction. Since the incremental change in the meridional force is of a second order in the z direction, it is neglected. Similar procedure is followed for the other directions to obtain the equations of equilibrium. In total, we will obtain three equations and three unknowns, which are solvable in this case. Hence, we can easily determine all of the internal forces in a simple shell just from basic sum of forces. Note that once bending moment starts acting in the shell, we need to find new equations to solve our system. Hence, it is beneficial to design shells where bending moment is negligible. Remember graphic static? Well, we can actually extend graphic static to design shells and vaults that have no tension in them. Doing such tasks by hand is extremely hard, so it is easier to implement them into a computer software. This is what the block group from ETH Zurich has done while creating Rhino Vault plugin. The group is led by Professor Philip Block, whom we met at Princeton, and he introduced us to the amazing pioneering discoveries that the group has made. By the way, if you are new to graphic static, I advise you to watch the previous episode where I talk more about it. The block group just released Rhino Vault 2, a plugin in Rhino software which aims at form finding of compression members. By the way, Rhino Software is a 3D computer graphics and computer aided design application. Even though it's a plugin in Rhino, Rhino Vault 2 uses Compass Python package, which was also developed by the Block group. After I met with Professor Block, I've actually used Compass in different projects related to floating series and hydrostatic to calculate intersection between lines and other manipulations of polygons. Usually doing such calculations requires lots of for loops in Python. But with the Compass package, I was able to do everything much faster. I'll provide a link in the description for more information about Compass. Going back to Rhino Vault 2, this plugin is based on thrust network analysis, which is a combination of a graphic static, linear optimization, and computational form finding principles. This method aims to generate compression only surfaces using funicular solutions. Using thrust network analysis, the shell is discretized into straight segments and then a solver is used to find the horizontal followed by the vertical equilibrium. The designer can also modify the internal forces in the force diagram and directly see the effect 
on the geometry in the form diagram. I downloaded the software and I will try to illustrate to you how the software works through a simple form finding example. Draw the pattern or concept of your structure that represents the horizontal projection of the eventual shell structure. In here, I want a structure with a plan area of 20 meters by 10 meters. Define the boundary conditions, which are the fixed points in the structure at which the external reactions will be present. After that, the horizontal projections can be turned into the form diagram. We can then construct the dual force diagram. At this stage, the force diagram is not yet correct, so we will use an iterative solver to achieve convergence that eventually reflect the correct force diagram. After that, you can give the desired height of your structure, let's say 10 meters. The vertical equilibrium utilizes the geometry of the form diagram to compute the locations of the vertices of the thrust diagram. After this is determined, the form will be in equilibrium with its self-weight. The resulting shape is funicular, which means under the self-weight, this structure has only compression in it. I'll provide a link in the description for more information about the Rhino Vault 2 and its application. So let's recap what we've learned from this episode. Optimized curved geometries are awesome in carrying loads and they are found in nature as well as in man-made structures. Shell equilibrium's equations are straightforward under some assumptions. And computer implementation of a graphic static and other optimization techniques are valuable for engineering designs. So that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching and see you in the next episode.